Data and images from the James Webb Telescope suggest that we should rethink this whole the universe had a beginning thing. At least that's what some people are claiming. But is that really a good claim? Well, we're joined by Dr. Hugh Ross to find out here on All Rise if that's true. All right. Well, all rise, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. We are. Uh, I'm joined here once again by author and speaker Abdu Murray. I'm your host, Derek Caldwell. And as you heard at the top of the show, we've got an interesting one for you today. We are talking about all the hoopla over the James Webb telescope. Abdu, are you excited to talk about this one or what? Yeah. I'm quite excited to talk about this, actually. I've been uh, following several people who have made posts about the incredible images from this incredible piece of technology, which are unre un un unveiling, I should say, some of the things that may have been hidden from our view uh, in the past, both into deep space, but also with familiar objects. You're seeing people post things right. on Jupiter, for example. We've looked at Jupiter for a long time. What more could we pop possibly see from Jupiter? Well, the telescope shows us some stuff. So I'm really excited about this. And I'm especially excited to speak with Dr. Ross about this because he's been posting some incredible, not just images, but some commentary on those images as well to help us think through what does this mean and how does this even paint a, a broader picture, I think of the glory of God. So yeah, I'm really excited to so, so let me let me just set the stage a little bit with some headlines that I've been reading and sort of the what, what all the uproar is about in the uh, science community. So here it goes. James Webb Space Telescope has discovered evidence of massive ancient galaxies that science say shouldn't exist. The Webb Telescope spots six galaxies that shouldn't exist. Astronomers detect six massive galaxies so old they can't be explained by science. Study confirms Webb Telescope debunks the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang that didn't happen. And, and, and from there, it just sort of spreads like wildfire. It's all over uh, things like Reddit and, and those sorts of sites. And so essentially the idea is the James Webb Telescope uh, challenges the Big Bang and what we thought we knew about the uh, the beginning, which challenges Genesis, um, which says everything had a beginning. And now people are starting to question, did it have a beginning because of these pictures that the James Webb telescope is finding? It's finding galaxies much uh, larger than was thought possible. So that's the, the gauntlet that's been set down. Uh, but before we go any further, I just want to remind everyone watching this, if you like this type of content, you want to see more. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment, and share. Help us get the word out. So, Abdu, as we think about this, um, what, what's help it explain, wrap this in sort of, you're from the legal background. Um, help make sense of what's going on here and what's being mm -hmm. asked uh, sort of in a legal perspective. Yeah, and this is actually the kind of thing where we some of the best legal shows you watch on television will always have that moment where the guy's been in prison for 20 years and falsely accused of something, and now the technology exists to exonerate him. You know, there's DNA evidence that suggests that someone completely different was there, or it couldn't possibly have been the defendant, and those cases will either go to a new trial – um, because new evidence has been adduced that the appellate court says, okay, the, the, the jury didn't have this evidence before. It needs this evidence to actually create a valid verdict. So we're going to order a new trial or the evidence is so good that we'll vacate the entire judgment of the trial court and let the person free or in a civil case, change the outcome of the civil litigation. And so essentially what's happening as I see it is there are people out there, whether they're legitimate scientists or not, but the popular level sort of journalism is saying, Hey, Hey, we have that kind of new evidence uh, about from the James Webb Telescope that suggests that the sort of the long held or standard model of the idea of how the universe got here, standard Big Bang cosmology should be overturned, or at least we should have a new trial. We should rethink this thing altogether um, uh, because we're seeing things we shouldn't see. They're older than they seem to, uh, the, that we would expect to be, or they have different properties than we might expect if the Big Bang uh, theory or the cosmology behind the Big Bang is actually true. Um, so this is actually a tough standard though, and people don't realize this. In order to overturn a verdict or a well-established idea, you have to have not just 
a scintilla of evidence or something that just pops into sort of our common parlance and says, oh, that changes everything. You have to have that tested and retested and legitimized by people who know what they're talking about before you can just overturn something. But in today's popular culture, all it takes is for someone, a popularizer, to say something with a big enough microphone and suddenly we rethink everything. And so you get a lot of people who are skeptical of a beginning or who don't like the idea of a beginning because it implies that there was a beginner. They want to challenge this whole thing. So that's the issue. Should we, and this is all of us as the appellate court, uh, overturn the verdict and ask for a new trial? Or should we say, maybe the, maybe the Big Bang isn't necessarily on life support. Maybe this whole case shouldn't be rethought. Maybe we should be a little more circumspect about this. And so as I was thinking about this and the, uh, the, the hoopla that's going on around this question um, on a popular level, um, but also on a scientific level, I thought of no one better to ask should we be rethinking this thing than my good friend and the friend of the ministry, Dr. Hugh Ross? Um, uh, I feel like I don't necessarily want to go into his bona fides, but I have to, but only because he's a friend. So I don't want to do that, the sort of formal introduction, but it's required here for a number of reasons. One, we want to validate the, 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 bon the bona fides of someone who can testify uh, or offer some insight to us as the jury about whether we should rethink this thing. So Dr. Ross is the founder and senior scholar of Reasons to Believe, uh, an organization that has benefited me greatly and many people greatly, uh, dedicated to communicating the compatibility, sorry, the compatibility of science and the Christian faith. Um, uh, Hugh gave his life to Christ uh, in college after his study of cosmology, and that cosmology actually convinced him of the existence of a creator, uh, specifically the God of the Bible. So this is a, a, a topic well-suited because this was a big part of Hugh's conversion experience. Uh, Dr. Ross holds a degree in physics from the University of British Columbia and a PhD in astronomy from the v University of Toronto, so really great institutions. And then he spent five years on the Cal Caltech faculty, and then he tradition transitioned, I should say, over into full-time ministry uh, at a pastoral team. So he not only is a scientist, not only is he an apologist, not only is he he a communicator of the gospel, but he's also a pastor. So he has a pastor's heart as well. He's written a lot of books. And um, I can reach over to my shelf, by the way, and just with my very large hands, because I'm six foot eight, grab just a stack of these books. This is half, actually a quarter of the books I have from Reasons to Believe sitting on my shelves. Uh, so they know of what they speak. So welcome to the show, Hugh. It's great to have you on. And I'm excited to talk about this topic with you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I do. Yeah, yeah. So let's um, let's set up some 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 familiarity because some of the viewers might not realize one a couple of things. What the James Webb Telescope is, because they might say, "Hey, wait a minute! Don't we already have a big telescope pointing at things? And we spend a lot of lots of money on it called the Hubble Telescope." What do we need another one for? What does this one do that's any different than the telescopes of the past? So give us a rundown of what the James Webb Telescope is, why it's different, and why it matters. Okay. Well, the James Webb Space Telescope is uh, about. Uh, six times bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope. So it can, uh, you know, see much fainter objects. And, and they purposely made it an infrared telescope because the purpose of the James Webb was to be able to give us insight into the early universe. Well, the early universe from planet Earth is highly redshifted. And so if you really want to see the physics of what's going on in the early universe, you need to look in the infrared part of the spectrum. So it's an infrared telescope. And we've had infrared telescopes in space before, uh, but this one's more than 100 times more powerful than that telescope. And they also purposely put it a million miles away so they could use it 24 hours a day. And so, uh, you know, the, the Earth and the Moon uh, really don't mess with it. And so uh, uh, it's a much more efficient instrument in that, that respect. And uh, as you mentioned, I've been keeping people up to date on the latest images from the James Webb Space Telescope on my Facebook page. But I always offer a commentary. What is this image, this new image that's been released? How does it give us more evidence for our Christian faith? And uh, you're right about all these articles that are out there that are questioning the Big Bang. And uh, what the lay public needs to realize is that there are many Big Bang creation models out there over a dozen different Big Bang creation models. And the purpose of the James Webb Space Telescope was to tell us which one of those Big Bang creation models uh, correctly describes the universe in which we live. And uh, it's already made some amazing advances on telling us which one 
of these Big Bang creation models is, is correct. Uh, I don't know of any astronomer uh, who's claiming that uh, the new evidence from James Webb is overturning the concept that the universe has a beginning. No astronomer saying that, but there are astronomers out there saying, we're seeing things we didn't expect. We're seeing things we didn't expect for certain Big Bang models, but there are Big Bang models that are predicting exactly uh, what we are seeing. And the other thing is that there's what I call initial observation bias. I mean, you're a lawyer, you might appreciate this. And in one sense, I'm older than you. This is deja vu for me. I can remember when I was in my early teens, when they were finding the very first quasars and people were disturbed. Uh, these quasars are way too bright and way too close to fit the Big Bang creation model. These quasars should be rare. Well, today we know of over 10,000 quasars, and guess what? Uh, the bright and uh, nearby ones are rare, just exactly what we said. But what was happening uh, some 60 years ago is that they didn't take into account the big, bright, close by ones are going to be the easiest to detect. Well, likewise for James Webb, the easiest to detect uh, early galaxies are going to be the big, bright ones. And people have been saying, well, we're seeing too many of them. Well, wait a minute. They're the easiest ones to detect. And so I've been telling people, wait until James Webb takes deep images. Only one's been taken so far. It's a 30-hour exposure. It revealed 50,000 galaxies. A couple of them were big and bright. The rest of them were small and faint. And so basically the initial claims are saying, well, wait a minute. Now that we're getting these deep exposures, and, you know, for a lawyer, it's like, you know, don't make a, a, a decision. Uh, don't draw a verdict until you get all the relevant data. And it's going to take about three more years of observations by the James Webb Space Telescope before we actually have a complete enough statistical database of what the galaxies near the universe look like. The first few images are just going to give you the highlights of the big bright ones. We need the deep images. But I think uh, what's, what's really exciting for me is that the very first stars will determine uh, what kind of Big Bang creation model you're dealing with. Uh, are those first stars really, some people are thinking the first stars are a thousand times the mass of the sun. Some are saying only 30. Some are saying, well, maybe 150, maybe 200. We didn't have a telescope before that had the power to answer that question. Even the James Webb Space Telescope cannot image individual stars uh, that were there at the very beginning of the universe. Uh, but it can, it, so, yeah. If I, if I, because one of these, this is, this is, uh, I got a, a ton of follow-up questions, but uh, one of the things that I think is um, important for um, maybe some of our listeners slash viewers, depending on if they're watching the podcast or uh, watching the YouTube show or listening to the podcast is, um, uh, let's if we get a little more basic just for a moment, because a lot of folks will know what you're talking about, but a couple of folks might be saying, well, wait a minute, how is the telescope telling us what happened in the past? Um, what is it that about the images that suggest we can know what happened way, way back uh, versus what's going on right now? Uh, I think a picture of something, obviously, I'm, I'm taking a picture of relatively the instant present. Um, but a telescope of this magnitude actually isn't taking pictures of the present. It's taking pictures of the past. Can you explain why that is? And then you also mentioned the thing about redshift. Now, I understand how redshift works in terms of right. uh, blue shift and redshift and when things are going towards us or away from us. Give us a, If you give us like a, like a two and a half minute primer oh, on sure. why the shift of the light matters and then what is the James Webb Telescope actually taking pictures of in terms of temporal? Well, you know, Ab, do I always tell my wife that because I'm an astronomer, I have no evidence of what's going on in the present. All of my data comes from the past. I mean, yeah. I look at the sun. I see That's lawyers too, by the way. <laughs> that's lawyers too. <laughs> yeah, I look at the sun as yeah. seen as it was eight minutes ago because that's how long it took the light to reach my telescope. Andromeda Galaxy, I don't see it as it is now. I see that it was two and a half million years ago because that's how long it took the light to travel. James Webb was set up to look at galaxies extremely far away, which means you're looking very far back in time. 
Really, its goal is to look at the very first galaxies that formed in the history of the universe. You know, so how do we know that they're that far away? Well, it's through the redshift. And so uh, we live in an expanding universe, which means the farther away we look, the faster galaxies are moving away from us. So by measuring the, you know, uh, the faster a galaxy moves relative to us, the more the spectral lines will be shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. And so on purpose, astronomers put these highly sensitive spectrographs on the James Webb Space Telescope so they could accurately measure to what degree are the spectral lines shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. And as they measure that shift, that tells them how far away uh, that galaxy is and therefore how far back and how far back in time we're seeing that galaxy. And uh, the red shifts they're getting are bigger than what we've been able to see before. So uh, James Webb right now is literally able to look at the very first stars, the very first galaxies. And uh, you know the maps we have of the cosmic background radiation uh, predict that the first stars are gonna form when the universe is about 350 to 380 million years old. So uh, we know how far away we need to look to see the first stars. And I think what's been uh, exciting for a lot of astronomers, we're getting galaxies very soon after the first born stars uh, show up. And so the question is, why? Well, it depends what kind of stars form. And so uh, the first stars are forming out of nothing but hydrogen and helium and a tiny amount of lithium. And astronomers have been wrestling for decades. If that's all you got in the periodic table, what does it tell us about the first stars? And uh, different theories say they're going to be different sizes. That's one of the goals of the James Webb. Let's actually make the observations and determine how massive those first stars are. But the more massive they are and the more stars that form at that time, the faster galaxies will form. So I think that's what's really exciting is we actually have the potential to say, hey, these galaxies are forming faster than we thought. That should tell us something about the, the first stars. The James Webb isn't powerful enough to see individual first stars, uh, but they can yeah. see the first galaxies. And by looking at the first galaxies, that gives them insight into what the first stars are like and tells them, okay, which Big Bang creation model is the one that really describes the universe. And if I could say one thing for your viewers that are reading all these popular articles, rule of thumb, don't give any credence to any popular article on the web unless they give you a link to a peer-reviewed paper uh, published in the mm -hmm. Astrophysical Journals. The really good journalists will always give you a link. And so I tell people, if you don't see the link there, uh, take everything you see with a huge grain of salt. Yeah. Well, I mean, Derek, um, you and I were talking and you brought up this, uh, this quote from uh, Joel Lejay, Lejay, actually. Lejay. Uh, Lejay, yeah. I think is how you pronounce his last name. Yeah, Lejay, um, which I think a lot of people ran yeah. with and interpreted it different than, than uh, Dr. Lejay actually meant himself. Uh, can you go ahead and read that quote yeah, for us, so, uh, Derek? Uh, you have I it? believe he's a Penn State astronomer. I believe he was one of the authors of this um, uh, study that everyone was citing, but in an interview, he said, um, we looked into the very early universe for the first time and had no idea what we were going to find. It turns out we found something so unexpected. It actually creates problems for science. It calls the whole, uh, it calls the whole picture of early galaxy formation into question. And it is, it's that last sentence that is the key kind of, you know, that we're now sort of, um, that's what's called into question, not the big bang but early galaxy formation yeah. and um, to Dr. Ross's point, it doesn't challenge anything about the big bang, but it's uh, it's just sort of out of a sea of, uh, or maybe, you know, 12 or so options. I think you mentioned that, that now we're getting some. Well, I, yeah. Yeah. I've been interviewed by journalists a lot and they're looking for something that's going to catch the reader's attention. Mm -hmm. So they'll interview you for 45 minutes and they'll purposely select that little <laughs> clip that gets everybody uh, motivated. And what I tell people is, okay, you got this uh, Penn State astrophysicist who made these comments to a journalist, read the paper that he published in the literature. 
the abstract is always free to the whole public. And uh, just reading that, you can get an idea of the tone. And what amazes me is you see this journalistic article on the web, then you read the paper and the tone is radically different. Yeah. And so oh, yeah. it's always good. I mean, yeah, again, if, if it's a, an honest journalist, he'll give you a link, follow the link mm -hmm. and actually see for yourself uh, what they say in the peer reviewed right. literature. Uh, well, yeah, a good friend of mine, Dr. James Tour, uh, just did a debate recently with Professor Dave, who's got like, uh, he's an atheist guy who's got a couple of million followers. And one of the things that Dr. Tour was trying to point out in the debate is you can't just read the abstracts. You know, the whole idea was, do we have a, a natural clue about the naturalistic origins of life? And Dr. Tour was saying, look, we don't really have a clue as to how it naturalistically came about. And no one really knows this stuff. And you can't just cite abstracts um, and then popular level articles about this stuff. You have to actually delve deep into whether the articles are saying or the, the the journal articles are really saying what you say they're saying. And, you know, nine times out of 10, and maybe even maybe more than that, maybe 10 times out of 10, the tone is different than the journalistic article. And it's not because the journalists are inherently dishonest or whatever it is. They have to write a very short piece about a very complex topic. And like you said, Dr. Ross, if they're honest, they'll give you a link to go read it yourself. The average lay person doesn't want to do that because they're not going to understand all of the all the nuances and all the terminology in there, which is why, friends, I'm going to urge you, you need to go to reasons.org um, because scientists like Dr. Ross, and he's done it, Hugh, you've done it. And one of the things I appreciate about you is that you take the, you have the ability to take relatively complex things that have so much research behind them and honestly tell us what it really means on a lay level or on a non, a non practicing science, a non practitioner level, um, for all of us to really interpret these things. So, and not only you, but the great team over at Reasons to Believe does this across the spectrum, not just with regard to physics, astrophysics, astronomy, but also biology and even philosophy with, with work like Ken Sample. So I really appreciate that. Um, uh, you know, we, we were talking about, so, so uh, I don't want to steal Derek's thunder. I think you've got some <laughs> questions too, Derek. So uh, if I keep going, I'll just keep asking questions. So well, maybe you well, have a question or two you want to ask Dr. Ross. A, a quick comment I'll do. This reminds me of one of our favorite Mitch Hedberg jokes uh, where someone asked him, <laughs> yeah. um, hey, you want to see a picture of me when I was younger? And he said, isn't every picture of you from when you were younger? So that's a... Uh, there's a <laughs> little humor for <laughs> that's yeah, my contribution. That's I'm clearly the dumb guy here, but friends, this is a viewer and listener supported ministry. Embrace the truth exists because of the generous donations of friends like you. You know, the content for our YouTube channel and our podcast is very research intensive. And when we spend time trying to create the content, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of money. Um, we travel all over the world as well. So your generous gifts are truly important to us. If you are interested in donating to this ministry, go to the link embracethetruth.org and you'll see some donate buttons at the top of our webpage. We'd love to get your support. God bless you. So Reasons to Believe is known for, you know, you're known for your testable creation model. And so I'd be interested in hearing um, your insights there because is there, when, when you got these images, what promise did you see from them for that? Were there things that you had already uh, predicted we should be seeing that, that were there, that um, the scriptures kind of point us toward, especially you know, the, uh, what a lot of people are, the articles that we've been talking about, a lot of people are taking it and saying, aha, no big bang. And if no big bang, then no creator, that gets us out of that uh, problem of the creator. Like uh, we were talking a little bit earlier that uh, certain scientists like to get out of uncomfortable problems like a beginning or fine tuning and, and things like that. Um, what did you, you know, what are you finding when you look at the, what James Webb, the James Webb Space Telescope is finding that is um, sort of shoring up your own personal faith, but also helping the model that uh, RTB has already created. Yeah, it's very encouraging for me personally, because I wrote several articles before the James Webb went up, basically saying, this is what I think it's going to discover. And lo and behold, mm -hmm. uh, what I predicted years ago is exactly uh, what's happening. Uh, and, you know, the James Webb is also giving us insights into star formation and our own galaxy. And in one sense, we knew already uh, that galaxies, at least some galaxies, formed very early in the history of the universe. Because guess what? 
we're living in a galaxy uh, that has very old stars in it. Uh, some stars that appear to be almost as old as the universe itself. So our own galaxy formed very early in the history of the universe. And so there is anticipation. Uh, while we do see other galaxies like ours, uh, therefore we would expect to find galaxy formation taking early. Uh, but that would require uh, that, you know, some astronomers were saying, you know, of all you got is hydrogen and helium in the early universe, you're not going to get a lot of stars, uh, or you're going to get stars that aren't very massive. While it gets so many galaxies forming early, uh, we know that that can't be correct. Uh, there are either more stars forming or they're more massive. And hey, just two days ago, uh, this paper got published in the British journal Nature. And uh, you know, every week, I write a, an article called Today's New Reason to Believe. Well, yesterday I started writing an article on this discovery because what they found uh, was a very metal poor star in our own galaxy. And uh, its age is such that it must have formed at the very beginning of the universe when star formation was possible. They looked at its spectra mm -hmm. and they said it had to be polluted uh, by a particular kind of supernova eruption. One that can only happen if the star that polluted uh, this very old small star uh, indeed comes in at more than 120 times the mass of our star, the sun. And so this is basically mm. confirming what we're seeing with the James Webb Space Telescope. So, you know, even looking at stars in our own galaxy are able to shore up what the James Webb Space Telescope is telling us. And hey, this is kind of the holy grail of astrophysics right now, is actually determining mm. what stars form first in the history of the universe, how many form, how massive they are. I expected this would be a three or four year project. What thrills me, even just two days ago, uh, we're a long ways to getting that answer. <laughs> mm. Mm. Wow. Wow. So when it comes to, if we were to say, okay, let's break it down for someone who uh, uh, understands that a, uh, a beginning of the universe uh, corroborates, or at least is consistent with the biblical account that everything began to exist, all matter, energy, space, and time began to exist at a finite point in the past. Um, coalesce for us to anything that you say, okay, like this is confirming, like, okay, because I, I mean, I'm looking right now, for example, at your book Navigating Genesis, which right, right on my on my on my shelf here, and you go through, um, uh, in, in in many forms, line by line, like what do these mean, and how does this actually uh, um, comport with the astrophysical record or the geological record? Are there some things that you're seeing now that like you can say, hey, there's another reason to believe you just writing an article about this now, but specifically pinpointed if you could, uh, and if it's possible at this point, maybe it's too early to say the biblical account says this, we're seeing this, that's exciting. Yeah, uh, certainly the James Webb Space Telescope is giving us greater evidence uh, for the Big Bang mm -hmm. creation model. And uh, you know, I mm -hmm. remember in the 20th century, the early part of the 20th century, when astronomers were first getting the inkling, hey, we live in an expanding universe. It's traced back mm -hmm. to the beginning. Uh, there were physicists and astronomers that reacted really strongly to that. The reason for the reaction was twofold. Number one, this looks just like the Bible. I don't like the Bible. We got to throw at this big bang. Uh, number two, yeah. uh, this makes the universe too young. In the early part of the 20th mm -hmm. century, there was a big debate going on. Is the universe quadrillions of years old or only billions of years old? Big Bang was telling mm -hmm. us it was only billions. And there are people like mm -hmm. Sir Arthur Eddington making the point, if it's only billions, we can't defend Charles Darwin anymore. We can't defend naturalistic evolution. We can't mm -hmm. make that work in only billions of years. And uh, they were pointing mm -hmm. at the stars that seem to be burning for trillions of years and saying the Big Bang is wrong. Well, now we know the people working on the stars were wrong. Uh, there are no stars that are trillions of years old. There are only billions of mm -hmm. years old. And so the young universe mm -hmm. astronomers won. Big Bang cosmology got mm -hmm. established. And hey, if that means that the Bible got it right and predicted it thousands of years ago, well, so be it. Uh, we're stuck with that. <laughs> and this is a problem for yeah. naturalistic biological evolution. Well, we need to accept that. And I think what's yeah. exciting for me 
leading paleontologists who have had an atheistic worldview perspective and are saying what we see in the fossil record is the opposite of what we predict from a naturalistic perspective. Naturalistic hmm. perspective, you get the proliferation of species first, and over time you get new genera, then you get new families, new orders, new classes. Last of all, you get new phyla. When we look at the Cambrian and Avalon explosions, we see the exact opposite. The phyla show up first, the species show up last. Mm. And there have been numerous mm. paleontologists saying, we can't defend a naturalistic interpretation anymore. Yeah. They don't like the God mm. alternative, but they're forced by the data to realize, well, so be it. Well, that happened a century yeah. ago in astrophysics. And what James mm. Webb is giving us is even a stronger case what the Bible taught thousands of years ago. Wow. You know, uh, what comes to mind, and we're going to play a clip um, from a, uh, a frequent, I put in air quotes, guest on the show. Uh, we talk about Neil deGrasse Tyson quite friend a bit, and we respond to his, his yeah. he's a yeah, friend of the show who doesn't know us, but yeah, <laughs> um, uh, we respond to him quite often. And this is a clip that I would surprise, might surprise the, the viewers to know that we actually might agree with it. Like, let's get your take on it. We're going to play it in a second here. But what you just said, and when you look at this, the picture that strikes me as so interesting is when we put a telescope a million miles out and we're pointing out to the stars as far away as possible, or we put a spade into the ground and we dig into the earth, um, or then we took a microscope and we'll look inside of ourselves, what we're finding over and over again is this increasing reason to have confidence that there's a purpose behind all this, there's a design to all of this, and it means something. And of course, history points to what that actually means. And I'm, re I'm reminded of Proverbs 25 verses two and three, where it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. You know, we can't see this stuff until we have telescopes powerful enough to do it, or until we shove a shovel into the ground and start looking. I know that's the crude way to look at it, but it, at the fossil record or the microscopes that can see, electron microscope that can see things we couldn't see before. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to search things out. It seems to me that we God has given us this ability to delight in discovery. I remember Hugh, I, I, the the when you started talking about um, the fact that we have perfect solar eclipses because our moon is exactly four hundred times smaller in diameter than our sun, but is also exactly four hundred times closer, and it wasn't always that way. Um, uh, and it happens to be that the only observable full solar eclipses happens to be on the only planet with actual observers. Yes. Um, uh, and that seems to me to be this a poetic dance. I love when you said that. That leads me to one more question, because I now I just thought of something. One more question about what James Webb might be, might be showing us is, are we getting anything? Because I have heard some buzz. I haven't heard anything substantial, but some buzz about habitable planets um, that might exist out there and James Webb showing this. Is that actually a thing right now? Is anybody talking about that? Or are we seeing evidence of habitable planets? Because you wrote a book, Improbable Planet, uh, that also talks about the, this, the way in which we're just so. So could you speak briefly about that? Then we'll play Dr. Tyson. Yeah, the James Webb Space Telescope, one of its missions is to actually use its uh, spectroscope to determine the composition of chemicals in the atmospheres of planets outside of our solar system. And it's done that with a couple of planets already. And there's been some buzz, hey, you know, uh, it has an atmosphere uh, with carbon dioxide in it and, uh, you know, with methane. And uh, that may possibly be an indication uh, that would be compatible with life. The real goal is to try to see if there's oxygen or ozone. Uh, but these are all chemicals in the atmosphere, including oxygen, that can be produced abiotically uh, without the agency mm -hmm. of life. And so uh, James Webb will not be able to give us a definitive uh, you know, signal that there's life on a planet. It can say, hey, it's possible, and this planet's not possible. It'll be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but what you'll see in both Design to the Core and Improbable Planet, the whole focus is on finding a planet where there's liquid water on the surface. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the most generous of the habitability requirements that astronomers look at. Uh, you know, for a planet to be truly habitable, it has to simultaneously be orbiting in all 13 known planetary habitable zones. And we found 5,400 planets uh, in the, uh, our galaxy so far. Of those 5,400, 
we know of only one planet that is in more than two of the 13 habitable zones. It's the same planet mm -hmm. that's in all 13, and you get one guess as to which planet that is. <laughs> so I have a guess. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, thanks, yeah. Hugh. Um, so, Derek, why don't we play that clip from Dr. Tyson and then get, get your reaction All to right, it, Hugh? It. Here's the point. The tenets of the Big Bang, that the universe started out small, hot, dense, uh, where matter and energy were a primordial soup, where the forces of nature had merged. All of that is thoroughly supported by observations of this universe. Thoroughly supported. Okay, now, there's some things that, well, did this really cause that or might it be something that we don't know about yet? And who ordered up the dark matter? We don't know where that came from. And where's this expansion? We don't know where that came from, but we can describe it and we can measure it. Here's the point. If tomorrow you have a new idea about how the universe works, it's going to enclose everything we've been talking about up to that moment that has been experimentally and observationally verified. You can enclose it in something deeper. Okay, You can say, oh, wait, I have an idea. Our universe is just one in a multiverse. Right. Fine. Okay? But our universe would have started with a Big Bang. Okay? Right. And our universe would have expanded from a dense, hot cool, uh, state and has been cooling ever since. That's observed and that's real and that's not going away. That's my point. So, so what you have are journalists trying to make clickbait. And if there's some little thing in the early universe that is still on the frontier, still being contested in the octagon, in the, in the, in the fight dome... And, and, and some new idea is emerging over another idea. People say, oh, Big Bang is in trouble. Scientists go back to the drawing. But Big Bang is not in trouble. Right. I'm just saying, it's not in trouble. It is a whole thing that could conceivably fit in a deeper, bigger idea. Right. But it's not going to be swapped out tomorrow. We're not going to find out tomorrow. Gee. Uh, the, the, the early universe was cold instead of hot. That is not going to happen. That's not how science works. Yeah, what Neil deGrasse Tyson says in that clip is what every astronomer would say. He's basically citing all the observational evidence uh, for the Big Bang creation model. Uh, he never mentions the word creation. He just talks about all the evidence uh, for the Big Bang and uh, how you know, there's really no uh, credible astrophysicist today that would deny uh, that evidence. I would add 100% of all the observational evidence sustains the Big Bang. I can't think of any piece of evidence that would counter the Big Bang. It's all in support of the Big Bang. The open question still is, well, what kind of Big Bang? We already know that what's called the Lambda CDM Big Bang creation model uh, is the model that describes the universe, which means it's a universe as dominated by dark energy, where the second most dominant component is cold dark matter. Uh, and that's what's happening with Big Bang cosmology. You know, 80 years ago, it's a Big Bang. And then, you know, about 70 years ago, it's a hot Big Bang. And then it's a hot inflationary Big Bang. And then it's a hot Big Bang with lots of cold matter in it. Then we said, well, it's cold dark matter, not warm dark matter. And oh yes, there's dark energy in it. So it's been happening over the decades. We're getting a progressively more and more detailed uh, Big Bang creation model. James Webb is going to take us to the next step of detail and tell us which of the many uh, Lambda CDM hot Big Bang inflationary models is the correct description of the universe. And it's actually going to give us a very detailed understanding not only the origin of the universe, uh, but of its history from the beginning right up to the present. Uh, the, the big missing window was like what's going on in the first three billion years. James Webb is mm -hmm. telling us what's happening in those first three billion mm -hmm. years. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Ross, real quick, do you think eventually or how long do you think it'll take before we do get images? We have the uh, advanced instrumentation to get images of those first individual stars. Do you think that will happen um, anytime in the next century? Well, uh, if 
we're really lucky, we might find a really big cluster of uh, these firstborn stars. Yeah. You know, say if you got a cluster of a thousand of these firstborn stars, and they're all coming in at say 200 times the mass of our star, the sun, James Webb will be able to pick okay. that up. Uh, but what if that is not the way the universe started? You know, maybe uh, the stars are coming in at 120 times the mass of the sun instead of 200 times. That's going to make it more difficult to detect, which means we're going to need a cluster of 10,000 stars. And now what if the universe doesn't produce that many stars in one little cluster? In which case, James Webb won't be powerful enough. Astronomers are already thinking, is it possible we can, uh, you know, uh, try to persuade the U.S. taxpayer uh, to fund something that's even bigger and better uh, than the James Webb? Uh, a very cheap project I'm interested in is to put radio telescopes in the backside of the moon. This can be done for just millions of dollars, not billions. And, uh, and the advantage of the backside of the moon, there's no ionosphere to mess up the radio observations. To this point, astronomers have not been able to make any observations at wavelengths uh, below uh, 30 uh, you know, uh, me uh, uh, hertz. And so we can go to the backside of the moon and make these very long wavelength radio observations. That will actually give us insight into what's called the cosmic dawn, the moment when the first stars form, because you get a radio signal uh, from those early stars, and the radio signal will tell you how massive those stars are. And so that will complement uh, what the James Webb will do and can actually do stuff for us that James Webb can't do for a very tiny fraction of the cost. Now, in fact, radio astronomers already have said, uh, this is a fantastic opportunity. We need to protect the backside of the moon because there's other nations saying, let's have a whole bunch of satellites orbiting the moon. Mm -hmm. While yeah. that happens, there'll oh. be radio interference. Yeah. And so oh, I see. we radio astronomers are saying, we need some kind of international law uh, that basically says, let's make the backside of the moon a national park for radio astronomy. <laughs> so you heard it. You heard it here, uh, le le legislators. Protect yeah. our backside. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, <laughs> cover your backside. Uh, yeah. Well, thank yeah. you so much for that, thank Dr. You. Ross. Appreciate and that. Yeah, I'll do it. Um, uh, my brain yeah. right now feels like one of Salvador Dali's clocks. So I think it's a good time to stop <laughs> and let's end with some final thoughts from both of you. I'd love to hear from both of you on this and just kind of yeah. wrap this up yeah. and uh, your thoughts on James Webb and the promise that it gives us. Yeah. So Hugh, I'd love to hear your final thoughts. Well, to me, this is like what I see in the book of Job and Psalms. The more we learn about nature, the more evidence we'll uncover for the supernatural handiwork of God. And this past year of James Webb Space Telescope initial images has done that in spades. And I can't wait for what's going to happen in the second year when it really gets down to the serious science. Mm, excellent. Excellent. Friends, um, one of the things that I think we should, uh, among the many things you should draw from this conversation is that um, don't always just believe the hype. Sometimes, you know, there, you, you should delve into something specifically to find out whether or not the headline is actually what the substance would uh, support. Um, so we'll always look into these things. You know, the Bible says that one comes along and makes a case and it seems convincing until another one comes to challenge him. Well, sometimes the very article that seems challenging challenges itself and the substance of it. So make sure you read those things. And if you don't have the these expertise to read those things, one, don't jump to conclusions yourself if you don't have the expertise to do so. But two, try to find those who do and those people who are honest with the data and are looking at these things um, with as much uh recognition of their own biases that they put aside to try to find out what the truth actually is. That's why we have experts with their bona fides. So Reasons uh, to Believe is a group of people who I would commend to your reading on these things. Whenever you find something in science that suggests that we should rethink everything, um, give it a pause. Go to reasons.org. Um, and some wonderful other scientists, James Tour is another one I mentioned before, as some people you can really look to and say, these are working actual scientists with great insights into these things and might give you either some excitement to, to, to think through or some, you know, something to calm us down a little bit as well. The bottom line here is, friends, is that as it stands right now, if we're looking to overturn the idea of a beginning, we 
can't, we don't have the kind of evidence that would call for the court to vacate the verdict or to have a new trial on to whether or not there was a beginning. At best, all we have is evidence to suggest how that beginning happened, and maybe we should have further inquiry and a more of a, of a trial on what that beginning looked like. But the fact that there was a beginning is not really in question. In fact, what we're finding is that we're more confirmed that there was a beginning, which of course goes right back to Genesis which one chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, which says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. My, our guest, Derek, has been and Dr. Hugh Ross, a good friend of uh, the ministry, a good friend of the show, um, someone uh, I think everyone should take a, if you haven't heard from Dr. Ross, you definitely should, and you should read uh, any one of his many, many books and the team at Reasons to Believe. Go to reasons.org to find out And a new one coming more. out soon. Uh, until then, ladies and gentlemen, yes, a new, a new one. Uh, they have a new one coming out every couple of weeks, it seems. They, they, but, but, I, but I say that tongue in cheek, <laughs> by the way, friends, because they're careful. I've talked with them. I've been at the, at the offices talking about the, the publication process and the review that goes through every single book before it comes out. It's not just, I have an idea, let me put pen to paper and just get it out there. They're careful. They're real scientists. They take their work very seriously. But something's coming out very soon. Be on the lookout for that. Uh, thanks, Dr. Ross, for joining us. We're looking forward to future conversations. Yeah, my pleasure. Until then, friends, the defense rests. This has been All Rise. 